to imply a certain level of uh, accuracy uh, uh, of any values within the data we get. So we're making inferences based on what we can find within data sets uh, that have numeric values relative to this. So if there were an article to be written uh, in 2013 that, that was uh, widespread among the populace and there was no change in the populace density at all, but the article was greatly discussed and, every, and highly disseminated for whatever reason and everybody talked about it, then we could be under the impression that the majority of the planet um, uh, would still be there, but that perhaps as many as 1.28 million people would not be, billion, excuse me, 1.28 billion would not be. So the, the idea is coming across that there was a population reduction at that level by that period of time or shortly in thereafter. But it, we don't see, um, uh, there, I mean, when we look around in the, in the situation at the moment, unless we have a sudden World War III, I don't see any impetus for that level of destruction that rapidly. I do see that the, uh, we could read it another way. And that is that we could read in the not-too-distant future articles that might be written along the same lines that would give us the same information and make us think this now and could have been interpreted as they were interpreted by us, uh, by me in particular, in the in 2003, 4, 5, and 6. And what they're actually discussing is an article that may come out or a series of um, uh, statements that we'll all discuss about how 1.28 billion people are to die uh, directly as a result of the Fukushima. Now, it doesn't mean they have died, but we would be thinking about it then as though it were a, uh, a past event, and that's how it would come back to us. And it may be entirely accurate, but it may also be talking about a 20- or 30-year period, We'd, but which we would not have gotten. Make sense? Yeah, so, it so, does. So, so when we're ask, answering Richard, yes, we have 1.28, and it just trails off, a uh, billion people being impacted, uh, that the data would suggest uh, perish between now and that, that time. But, again, it's, it's all in the wording. Well, Richard also asks, is there going to be a geographic pole shift or a major crustal slippage or a magnetic pole reversal? And if so, what percentage of Earth's population are going to pass out of this plane? And I don't see any of those going. And the magnetic pole reversal is... Um, uh, potentially more of a problem to us than anything. We won't have a physical crustal shift. I'm quite convinced that the all of the data of the past um, century that interpreted uh, from Velikovsky forward, that interpreted, including Hapgood, that interpreted uh, as a physical crustal shift are more easily explained with the expansion of the planet, which is a wilder idea, if you will. It's actually yeah. easier to conceive of the skin of the orange slipping around than the orange growing. So... Um, uh, no, I don't see that happening, and uh, those were are not participatory in our die-off. We've got enough crud going on now that'll kill us off. As a matter of fact, the powers that be deliberately spiked the loop current in order to kill off the Gulf Stream, in order to alter the the um, jet streams, in order to concentrate the radiation in the northern hemisphere, such that background levels would go to such a high extent that they could count on a certain level of humans not surviving. But there's an even screwier interpretation, too, if you want to get in it. It's, um, it's really goofy, in it, and it relates to some, some strange, magical kind of stuff that um, is beyond uh, the uh, ability of the rational mind to really wrap its head around and so it falls into belief systems. And so we find, for instance, that the belief systems of uh, curious people like L. Ron Hubbard, this uh, strange fellow that created a religion, uh, also had a lot to do with the, the JPL laboratory and the formation of NASA. Was He was a, a magician, a dark black magician kind of a fellow, and was uh, into sexual magic, and he was deeply involved in the Illuminati, and he wrote a bunch of science fiction books. And he was a, you know, a passable science fiction writer. Uh, not great. I mean, he wasn't an Asimov or a Heinlein or anything. But curiously, one of his books was made into a big, mega kind of a serious movie. And a lot of money put behind it, good special effects and so on. And it bombed. And it was just a abysmal bomb. And it is Battlefield Earth, I think they call it. And it has uh, John Travolta and it is this nine or ten foot high alien. The point of all of this being that the background story to that 
novel existence since the 50s was that there would be a general level from a series of uh, circumstances, a general level of radiation increase around the planet that the, was almost deliberately done because the big space aliens are not radiation hardened. And so they would need to keep the humans around just to go out and about in the area because we are relatively radiation hardier than they were. And so now there's a screwy explanation for it. And you can actually see in a wild science fiction kind of a story way how a subgroup of the powers that be knowing that the... Um, uh, the bloodline people's uh, greatest wish that their ancestral space aliens are going to come back would do just this in order to cause problems for those space aliens when they arrive. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Cliff. <laughs> you know, a little less gloomy, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know um, a lot of the guys here have a radioactive personality, but would you be able to tell us what the reading is now and um, also maybe when you finish, shut it off? Oh, sure. Yeah, I can go ahead and turn it off. Yeah, I just, um, we're running at about um, uh, 0 0.03 um, millisieverts. So, so it's uh, the, the real key here is that uh, at that level of constant clicking there, the shocking uh, component is that when I got my first uh, calibrated Geiger counter in, or radiation meter in 2003 our background radiation was one click every seven or eight minutes so we are on several orders of magnitude higher than that definitely um okay we're going to go on to some science and spirit questions and the first one's from paul good morning cliff paul Rida. Morning. with your prismatic experiments underway have you considered this change in the energy of light will be instrumental in the unveiling or lifting of the veil? And as a second part of that, if this veil is lifted, will it result in the return of concepts such as prana, chi, or life force driving the universe? Or will it, due to the Illuminati Hollywood influence, be mistaken for an alien visitation? Probably both. Uh, it's going to just depend on who. There's a lot of us, so there's going to bound to be tons of people that will misinterpret it. Uh, as to the light issue, I don't know that light is a causal a agent here. I see light as a symptom. And so the changes in the light are a symptom of the underlying uh, vibrational intensity uh, um, uh, issues. Let's examine for a second my viewpoint that... Uh, Every 20 or 22 trillion times a second, we get a pulse, and that, that that is the basic operating frequency, if you will, or basic crystalline frequency of the watch that we call uh, universe or the materium. And actually, I don't see that that pulse is changing, but your uh, use of the word the veil lifting is very apropos because um, myself and many others who, of whom I've been in contact that are uh, active meditators have been aware that what we call the stream is very active now. And, it, and I'm thinking that, well, there's one explanation, and that is that the energy itself is more active. We have more amperage for our electricity, so to speak. But another explanation is that our ability to perceive it is uh, becoming um, uh, less obstructed. And so if it's less obstructed, then perhaps the veil on our, us is actually lifting as we speak, and, and many of us are able to perceive it uh, right now. And I think that's probably the better explanation for what's going on. It's quite clear if you talk to the people that are meditating meditating, uh, especially in 2011, there's been a real acceleration, a quickening. And there are many people now I know that were uh, stream enterers, and they just don't have the um, uh, personal energy to do it at the levels they used to because it's so uh, excitatory or it's in such an excited state. And I think actually that really it's not that the stream is any more excited, but we're reaching down closer to that 22 trillion times a second uh, basic universal pulse. Thank you very much, Cliff. Yeah, yes, yes, that's that's excellent. Thank you very much, Cliff. A quickening of of correct, control. correct. All of those terms apply, and it's it's really curious. You see people using the the term, you know, the uh, uh, shredding of the illusion, which actually is more meaningful in Sanskrit, and that is indeed what's going on. It is as though the the veil is lifting, or or um, I think of it as dropping because of how the, my relationship with the stream is always above me and not below me. But nonetheless, more of it is becoming exposed. It's quite a, quite uh, interesting, uh, very scary too. 
this is Chipper Dog, and that leads me to the question that I wanted to ask, which I've already asked you once, and you came back and said that you want to noodle this. Yeah. yeah. And that is, do you have and would you be amenable to sharing or pointing towards any practice, techniques, books, foods, meditative, individual and or group, et cetera, that might go towards helping moderate and develop more faculty with just what you're talking about? And some of the more traumatic psychic level developments being brought along with this transition event rapidly climbing our backs, so to speak. With the caveat that every person's destiny is their own. And see, that's, I mean, it gets into real problems there because yeah, of the, I agree with you on that. Sort yeah, of. it's the, the issue is, is the um, unwitting alteration of your own personal karma by unwittingly causing someone else to misinterpret your words and take a series of actions because of how they may perceive uh, your personal or your personality. And that's right. really what it comes down to, okay, is that people take my words as though they yep. really mean something and I'm not just some bald guy in the woods that's, you know, just done a lot of weird things. And so yeah. they, they put some weight to it. And so I have to be careful because I could say, well, Vipassana uh, meditation is really cool and everybody should go in yep. and, and jump into that. And I'd be an idiot because everybody should not. Household meditation is not for everybody, just as, you know, Tibetan Buddhist meditation is not for everybody, and so on and so on and so on. And meditation itself is not for everyone because you must acknowledge before you go into it that, that the practices that are of the Vedic tradition, the meditation and the yoga, will change your personality. Should you pursue them, they will alter you forever. And that is a... Um, uh, an aspect of your karma you need to be able to face. And Correct. so, so given that as a caveat, I personally have found Vipassana meditation as a householder to be really whiz-bang stuff. I mean, it's really cool. <laughs> and, uh, and a lot of the uh, strict meditators in the Chan or the Zen tradition, you know, they give you uh, a real ration of uh, hard stuff there for being a householder. But nonetheless, there have been more enlightened householders than, than enlightened Zen masters. And so, yeah, quite a few more. Quite a few more, correct. So, that being the case, at the pinnacle of, of successful practical tools is the beginnings of everything. And for me, was insight meditation and, and yoga. And I can only speak from personal experience. So, there's, you know, I don't know really, uh, I, I'm very hesitant to advise women at all because there are some fundamental differences that I've become aware of in these last years between male. Uh, uh, vortices are, and how we express ourselves as our body and, and then the vortices themselves. And so I'm sure that some of my practices are not good for women. And uh, you've got to be real careful about that. But given that, everybody that is interested in meditation will do themselves well to consider Vipassana as an entry point and then discard it as soon as you find something more suitable to you. But, but practices for... Uh, uh, purity of body, anything that will get you closer to harmonious um, interaction with your environment. So you don't want to do anything extreme by, you know, like uh, trying a particular kind of a diet or a regimen or, or this sort of thing. You need to start off with the idea that your goal is harmonious balance, to be right in that middle of the vibrational swings of the pendulum, to be in the sweet spot the whole time rather than work towards some extreme or other. Yes, I thank you. That that all goes along with what I feel as well. But I okay. I'm I lost a train. Sorry. <laughs> That's <all> right. <laughs> I have a lot Thanks. of this these days, and I'm sure a lot of it is the solo lunius too. By the way. Well, you know, I w I was thinking the 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 integration of the individual's perception of their extent, if you will, their field. Uh, 